we are we are trying to work with a large corpus which is not going to fit into main memory so our indexer needs to do sorting on data that is not going to fit into main memory but will be resident on the disk and so the algorithm the external sorting algorithm that we come up with needs to minimize the total number of disk seeks and what is the kind of data we have we have a stream of ordered pairs right each ordered pair is of the form term id comma doc id and each ordered pair is about 8 bytes long okay 4 plus 4 storing the term id and the doc id and this stream is generated as we parse the documents in the corpus so as we parse a given document we split it into a stream of tokens each of those tokens is normalized and then we get these normalized term id comma doc id pairs and we need to sort about a hundred million of them and this stream is initially sorted with respect to doc id but we need to finally sort it with respect to term id now because this entire stream does not fit into main memory what i was saying was let's let's try to fit in let's take one tenth of this whole size hundred million let's say we just take ten million of these records and then you know bring them into main memory so 10 million of them can easily fit into main memory 100 million of them may or may not be able to but 10 million of them can fit into main memory so let's fit in 10 million of them and there will be so think of dividing your entire 100 megabyte 100 million uh, records into 10 blocks each of size 10 million now what we're going to do is we will sort each of these individual blocks independently okay so we will sort each of these 10 million entries for those 10 blocks independently that is something we can do in main memory because each of those 10 blocks fits into main memory so in fact what we could do is as we are generating this stream of 100 million um, term id doc id pairs the moment we hit the first 10 the moment we complete the first 10 million entries we'll sort it okay and then we'll write the sorted stream on disk and we're going to sort by term id which is what we wanted at the end then when we uh, then we'll go back and we'll start parsing uh, the documents again and once we cross the 20 million mark that means once we once we create 10 million more ordered pairs we will again sort those 10 million ordered pairs and then store them on the disk. So at the end of this, once we have parsed or generated all 100 million of these ordered pairs, we will have 10, we will have 10 sorted blocks on disk. Is that clear? And each of, uh, if you look at each of these individual blocks, they will be sorted with respect to the term ID and secondarily with respect to the doc ID like before. Okay, so now we need to somehow merge these 10 blocks into a single unified sorted sequence. And that is something we can do exactly like we were doing the merge procedure earlier. Okay, so let's say this is the content of one of the blocks. This is the content of another block. Note that each of these blocks are sorted with respect to the term. Now if we want to merge these two blocks, how do we merge these two blocks into a block of double the size? Well, we can we can we can do the merge. Uh, so I, last time I remember I asked you to look at merge sort, uh, and the merge step of merge sort is pretty much what we're going to do here. So we will we will bring the initial part of this block into main memory. We'll bring the initial part of the second block into main memory, and then we'll merge 
the, the portions that we've got in main memory and then prepare an answer list which will have this sorted sequence. Once we are done with here, once our pointer crosses this boundary, we will get this one from the disk as well, the next portion of this block from disk into main memory and work with that. So in this way, we'll keep on generating this answer list and once the answer list grows large enough, we will push it to disk and then go on adding more and more entries to the answer list until we are done with both these blocks and, and at that stage our answer list is complete and we'll push whatever remaining part uh, has continued to remain in memory onto the disk. So we'll create these merged postings and we will in fact store them on the disk itself. Right. So both these blocks were initially on the disk we started getting them, uh, we, we got them into main memory, we sorted them and then we are storing them back on disk. Now note that we didn't get these two blocks entirely into memory, in main memory at this, uh, you know, in one shot. We, we were only fetching the next portion of the block during the pointer walkthrough, right? Again, we are going to have a pointer walkthrough through both these blocks and as the pointers were crossing the portion that was in main memory, we were getting the next portion from the disk. Is that clear? This is actually pretty simple to understand, uh, but I just, I just want to make sure that you're not confused about this. It's just a simple adaptation of the merge sort procedure to work with data that is on disk. So if we had 10 blocks and if we sorted let's say we paired them up into five pairs and then we sorted each pair at the end of this we would get five blo sorted blocks on disk right each of size each of double the size of those in individual 10 blocks okay now how do we merge these five blocks into a single block well again we can do something like what we just did we can group them two at a time and then merge two of them into another block of double the size following exactly the same procedure. Okay, so this is something that I've already discussed. We're going to read each block from the disk into main memory and we're going to independently sort each block using the standard internal sorting algorithms like quick sort. And then we're going to store those 10 sorted blocks on disk each of those 10 blocks contains about 10 million records and this is basically the pseudocode of that algorithm. So n here is the block size, sorry the, the, the block number. Okay, So initially we have uh, the first block we work with has a block number of 1. So what we do is we start parsing all the documents in the corpus and as we are parsing the documents in the corpus we are generating a stream of term id doc id pairs. We generate enough number of ordered pairs to fill into one single block and that is the first block. Then we sort that first block which is what this step is doing. It's sorting the first block and the sorted block is then going to be written to the disk into a file called f1. Then we'll go back and create the second block. Okay, So we'll continue parsing the documents from where we had left. We will again fill in one block with those records, sort that block and then write them to the disk. And we'll keep doing this until we hit the end of the corpus. And in this example, we assume that we'll hit the end of the corpus once we've uh, worked, once we've, once we've generated 10 blocks. And at the end of this while loop, then we have to merge those 10 blocks into a single stream that is sorted with respect to term IDs. Okay, so from 10 sorted blocks, we have to merge them into a single block. And this merging can happen like this. We merge, we, we group them into pairs and we merge each pair into a super block. 
Then we take each pair of super blocks and merge them into a super super block. This one remains as it is. And then we can merge these two. And then finally merge these two. And this is going to be the final unified sorted sequence. So this is called uh, a binary merge step because at each step we are merging two blocks into one. Okay. So if we had about 10 blocks to start with, we'll have about four levels before we are able to unify all the blocks into a single sorted block. Okay, so these are the runs being merged. So these are two blocks, for example, on disk. The first block has one and then three, and the second block has two and four. And finally, once they are merged, they will have one, two, three, four in sorted order. Okay, of course, these are going to be ordered pairs. They're not going to be single integers. But just to give you an idea of what the relative sequence will be after the merge step. Okay, and this merged uh, block is going to be stored back on disk. Now, just as we discussed in the last time that it's possible to work with more than two pointers in the merge step, likewise, we don't have to do this kind of binary merge. We could actually have 10 pointers pointing to the beginning of all 10 blocks. And then we could do a pointer walkthrough of all 10 of those pointers together. So that way, we can merge all 10 of them in one shot into a single sorted sequence. Okay, so of course the way this will happen is very similar to the way we were uh, merging them two at a time, which is that you'll, if, if this is a block, okay, and this if this is the sequence of records in the block, you will fetch the first few records of each from each block into main memory. Right? Note that all 10 of them won't fit into main memory at the same time, right? because they're all on disk and their size is larger than what, uh, their total size is more than what can fit into main memory at any time. But if we just fetch the first few records of each, each of those 10 blocks into main memory and then do the merge and once the pointers, the 10 pointers are for, you know, for each of those 10 blocks, once they cross, once they cross this region, then we can fetch the next few records from that block into main memory. So at any time we are only working with a small window within the block. But by this merge procedure, as answers start accumulating in the answer list, again we'll wait for the answer list to grow to a large enough uh, size that it corresponds to a block size and once it grows to fill in a block we'll just push that answer list onto the disk and then again you know we'll accumulate the next few entries in the answer list until they fill in one block and then we'll again push that block into the disk right after uh, the previous block now if you do this then you'll end up minimizing the total number of disk seeks Right? And, and why is that? Because um, you're just doing a linear scan of all the 10 blocks. Okay? And you can't do better than a linear scan. Right? So you're basically going to minimize the total amount of disk seeks that you do if you follow this procedure. Is that clear? Any questions on this block? Um, blocked sort based indexing. I don't know if you've done this in your database systems course. Have you have you done external sorting in your database course? Because usually this is discussed in a database systems course. No. No. Um, no sir. We didn't do external sorting. Sorry? We haven't done external sorting in our database. Okay. Okay. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask right now. This is actually an important algorithm. This is something you should know. Uh, do you work on uh, Linux workstations over there or do you work on Windows? Both. 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 So, if, so you must have used the Unix sort command, right? Yes. So the Unix sort command it basically implements uh, 
uh, is an external sorting algorithm. It, so it, it does pretty much what we just discussed. It uses uh, the disk to, uh, uh, to do external sorting. Right, so you can sort huge files using uh, the Unix sort command. And note that this, this algorithm works, it doesn't matter what the size of your file is. As long as it fits into your hard disk, you can sort it. Excuse me, sir. I have a yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, sir, can we uh, use uh, merge sort for the external sort by any chance? Yeah, this is actually merge sort itself. right? Except that in merge sort, uh, what you do is you... Uh, I mean, think of this as being merge sort itself. But what you're doing is as long, uh, as soon as your problem size is small enough that your data entirely fits into main memory, at that stage you can use quick sort to sort that data in main memory. Right? Whereas in, in, in merge sort that you discussed in your algorithm, you would, you would keep dividing and conquering the original problem until you end up with problem sizes of size 1 or 2. Right? Here you don't have to uh, come down all the way to a problem of size 1 or 2. Here you have to come down, come down to a problem of size 10 million or whatever size or whatever size problem you need in order to fill in main memory okay, and that is the size at which you stop and you do quick sort at that stage yeah. thank you sir. Yeah. so this is a pretty similar to the merge step of merge sort this is in fact the, exactly the same except that this merge step is happening from the disk Any other questions? No, sir. Okay. So, uh, note that our assumption here was that we we are keeping we can keep the dictionary in main memory here. In other words, we are storing this term to term ID mapping that I described earlier we are storing this also in main memory throughout this algorithm right? because we are ultimately working with term IDs with term ID doc ID pairs but we need to keep track of what term maps to what term ID right? because finally when we create the postings lists that is what we'll be doing we'll be mapping terms to um, basically its postings list for every term we need its postings list Now, we could potentially have worked with term comma doc id uh, ordered pairs directly instead of term id comma doc id pairs. But the problem with this was that some that many of the terms or most of the terms will be larger than uh, four bytes, right? So your intermediate files will become very large. But actually, it's not a problem. We could have still done this, and this algorithm would have still worked. It's just that you know, your files would have been larger because this component of the ordered pair would have been more than 4 bytes. But you can still run the same algorithm. So, if you are maintaining this term, term to term ID mapping uh, in main memory as you are implementing this sorting, uh, the way you will maintain this map is initially this mapping will be empty then when you pass the first doc first document you may see about 50 terms in it so you'll create term IDs for those 50 terms and keep track of which term was mapped to what ID then when you pass the second document you may encounter 20 more terms and then you'll add those 20 more terms to this map so as you're parsing more and more documents your mapping is going to grow in size okay and uh, our assumption is that at no stage does this mapping grow so large that it can't fit into main memory itself okay so every time we see a term in a document that we parse we check whether that term has already been mapped to a term ID or not if it's already been mapped to a term ID, we'll take that term ID and 
we'll we'll write that term id comma that doc id into an ordered pair and if the term that we are seeing has not yet been assigned a term id then we'll assign it the next higher term id add it to this map and then again create an ordered pair of the form term id comma doc id and the goal of storing term ids here again is to minimize the space because this can fit in four bytes so the second one is actually similar to the first one in some respects uh, but there are some differences so the first key idea uh, could you please switch off the microphone yeah thank you the first key idea in this uh, algorithm which is called the spimi algorithm single pass in memory indexing what this algorithm does is it does not maintain that term to term id map that we just discussed it's going to work directly with term comma doc id pairs okay so there is going to be no need to maintain the term to term id mappings so that's the first key idea the second key idea is it's not going to do and it could require any sorting okay and this is actually pretty remarkable if you think about it because there is a very simple way to build a dictionary for each block without needing to sort so how do we do that well imagine parsing the first document okay so you'll generate a set of terms all with doc id of 1 now you can dynamically create a dictionary and keep adding these terms that you are seeing to the dictionary okay so you can build a dictionary dynamically as you are seeing more and more terms in that document you will keep on adding those terms to this dictionary and then from each term you will have again all this is happening in main memory right this entire stream is being generated and is being stored in main memory until you run out of main memory okay and that's going to become one block so within a block within the first block what you're doing is as you are seeing more and more terms you're adding them to the dictionary and at the same time you're adding the doc ids you're seeing to the ends of the postings list that you're seeing for those terms okay so let's say there's a term like uh, moon okay so moon appeared in the first document and so i'll add a posting with the doc id 1 now let's say when parsing the 10th document i again see moon so what i'll do is i'll take that uh, ordered pair moon comma 10 i know that moon is in the dictionary so i'll just take that 10 and append it to the end of that list then when i encounter moon again in the 25th document i will just take that doc id 25 and append it to the end of the moon list because the doc ids i'm seeing are in increasing order every time i have to add a new posting i can just add it to the end of the existing postings list for that term and that way the postings list that will be created for this block will already be sorted i don't need to separately sort it is that clear so what we can do is we can do something like this and generate a complete inverted index for each individual block without needing to sort it and then just like the previous algorithm we will have 10 separate inverted indexes one for each block stored on disk okay and in the merge step we will again merge these 10 indexes into a single index okay and this merging is pretty similar to the previous merge uh, to, to the merge step of the previous algorithm we saw because what we will do is because the index will be stored in sorted order of terms so we'll just take the first few terms of the first index first few terms of this index the first few terms of this index first few terms of this index and so on with their postings list of course and bring them all into main memory all 10 of them 
and then we will do some kind of a merge procedure where we will unify those 10 uh, sections using those 10 pointers that are walking through each of those 10 lists and once any of the pointers crosses uh, uh, the boundary of those few records that we got into main memory we will fetch the next few records from that block So here is the pseudocode for the algorithm. It's a little complicated, but uh, just bear with me. Uh, it's not written in the best, in the simplest possible language, but we can try to make sense of this. So this is the algorithm, spimi invert. Output file is the file that is that at the end of the algorithm is going to have the entire inverted index. Okay. So, what we do is, we initially start off with an empty dictionary. Again, we are going to build an inverted index for each individual block. Right. So, in preparation for building the index for the first block, we are starting with an empty dictionary. Now, as long as I still have free memory available, I will generate the next ordered pair. Okay, I will generate the next term comma doc ID pair. Okay, I'm assuming here that we are parsing the documents in the corpus sequentially one by one, assigning every document that we are seeing a higher ID, one more than the previous ID. So as long as I still have free memory available to fill in the block, I'm going to generate the next term comma doc ID pair. Okay. And I'm going to check if this term already exists in the dictionary or not. If it does not exist in the dictionary, I will add it to the dictionary. Okay. If the term does not exist in the dictionary, I will add it to the dictionary and I will create an empty postings list for that term because it's the uh, it's, it's the first time I'm seeing that term, so I'm going to create a postings list. It won't exactly be empty. There, there'll be a single element in that postings list. It will be this particular doc ID. Okay, so I'm adding this line is adding the term to the dictionary and creating a postings list for that term with a single element, which is this particular doc ID. If this term did exist in the dictionary, that is this else condition. If this term was already in the dictionary, that means there must have been an existing postings list for that term. So I'm just going to look at that postings list. And I'm going to just ignore these two lines for the moment. I'm going to add this doc ID at the end of that postings list. So actually this particular line is something that is common to both this and this right because it's appearing outside this if condition so think of this as just creating an empty postings list think of just as just retrieving the existing postings list and in either case you want to add this doc id to the end of the postings list so that is something you can do outside this if condition because it's the same thing you have to do regardless of whether the then condition is true or the else clause is true Now, there are these two lines over here, which correspond to what happens if your postings list become full. So we are assuming here, recall from chapter one, that variable length arrays make a lot of sense when you are implementing uh, a postings list in main memory, because uh, you know you can exploit caching and so on. You can just add new elements to the end directly. So of course you can do that with a linked list also, but then you'll, you're also going to save space on pointers. You don't need pointers if you implement a postings list using an array, because the next element is just, uh, the next entry in the postings list is just going to be stored in the next element of the array. So you'll allocate a certain amount of space in the array for the postings list. Now as more and more postings get added to that array, at some point you may run out of space in that array. In that case, 
you may have to basically create a larger array of double the size as the previous array and then restore all the elements from that array into that new larger array okay so th that's what this line is doing it's saying that if i run out of array space then i'm going to create a new array of double the size and then transfer all the elements from that previous array into this larger array now at the end of this step 10 what i would have is i would have an inverted index for that particular block okay now i need to write that particular inverted index to the disk and the way i'm going to write it to disk is i'm going to write it in sorted order of terms right so i do need to do some amount of sorting here but this is just a sorting of terms this is not a sorting of term comma doc ids i want to ensure that the first entry i write to disk is the postings list for the first term in lexicographic order the second postings list that needs to be written to disk is of the second term in lexicographic order and so on so i'm going to sort the terms in the dictionary and write down the, their post and, and write their postings list to disk in that particular sorted order so this is how i create an index for one block and i'll do this for all 10 blocks and then finally merge the inverted indexes for those 10 blocks into a single unified inverted index any questions about this algorithm it's pretty similar to the previous one uh, with some variations as i described in the previous slide you're not actually doing sorting of term comma doc id pairs you're just directly accumulating the postings and you're not maintaining a separate term to term id map you're directly storing term comma doc ids Now, as you will see in the next uh, chapter, the postings lists and the dictionaries will need, will need to be compressed so that they fit into main memory and hard disk respectively. And compression techniques can work well with uh, the sorting algorithm that I just saw. But of course, uh, unless you know what those compression techniques are, it's going to be difficult to make sense of this slide. So let's just ignore it for now. These two algorithms that we just dis discussed were on static collections. Okay, we've been working with static collections right from the beginning of this course. Okay, so we are assuming that our corpus is static for now. Uh, it's not dynamically changing. And moreover, uh, we also assumed here that data fits into the hard disk of a single machine before this we were assuming that the data fits into the main memory of a single machine now we went with a more general uh, case more realistic case where your data is larger than what it can fit into main memory here we assume that it all your data can fit into the hard disk of a single machine the next thing that we're going to do is to work with even larger data. So the data that now we are going to see is not even going to fit into the hard disk of a single machine. So your, the total data will need to be stored across multiple machines now. Okay, And this is what all web search engines do. The amount of data that they have to create an index on cannot fit into the disk of a single machine so what they do is instead of working with a single machine they work with an entire cluster of machines and the task of indexing is distributed across the different nodes of that cluster okay, so each individual machine in the cluster is called a node and we are going to see a technique for 
parallelizing this indexing operation across an entire cluster of machines. Now, as I described at the beginning of this lecture, every node inside the cluster, every individual machine in the cluster is fault prone. It's possible that individual machines could unpredictably either fail completely or slow down. So we need to be able to reassign the tasks that are assigned to that machine to some other machine so that the cluster as a whole is able to build the index. So the question is how do we use this entire cluster or this pool of machines to carry out this task of indexing. So there are actually two terms that probably need to be uh, distinguished. There's something called grid computing. There's something called cluster computing. Both are forms of distributed computing. So what's happening in distributed computing is that your computing task is distributed across an entire set of machines. But in grid computing, the machines can be of very different kinds. Okay, so I don't know how many of you have heard of the folding at home project or um, the SETI at home project where, you know, there are these various scientific, complex scientific tasks which are assigned to machines all across the world, you could volunteer your machine to, to, to be doing some computations in the service of, uh, you know, these biological or uh, astronomical problems that people are working on. So every time the screensaver runs on your machine, your machine will start doing computation uh, that is required by this project. Okay, so you can volunteer your machine to uh, actually do some computation for one of these projects. But the point is that your machine could be very different from you know some other machine out there in the world. So there can be an enti entire variety of computers that can be used in the service of this computing task. So that's what happens in grid computing. The individual machines in that set of uh, machines doing the computation can be very different. They can be heterogeneous. In cluster computing, the individual nodes in a cluster are homogeneous. They are more or less the same, you know, the same kinds of machines. And this is what we, this is what web search engines use. So they use a cluster. So web search engines, like whether it's Google, Bing, Baidu, or whatever, they contain commodity machines. Commodity machines are just ordinary machines like you know the, the, the PCs that you get in the market. They contain normal machines making up a huge cluster of machines. right? And this cluster is stored in a facility called a data center. So a data center can be a huge warehouse storing you know these clusters of machines. For example Google's data centers are estimated to have about a million of such machines and each machine having on an average three cores or three processors. So there are about three million processors working on building uh, you know the, the, the web search index that, that Google constructs and of course doing some other tasks as well. Now this data is not public. Okay? Nobody outside of uh, certain sections of Google would actually know how many uh, servers they, act, they or, or nodes they have in their uh, entire cluster. But these are just estimates that are publicly available in, in, in some of the reports that people have written. Now all those machines in a cluster will not be stored in a single data center. There will be many data centers, each data center having you know a few thousand or a uh, uh, machines, for example, or tens of thousands of machines. And these data centers can be placed at different locations in the world. So if you make a query to Google, for example, your query is not necessarily going to come to Mountain View. 
where the headquarters of Google is located. It could be it could be uh, sent to a data center somewhere in Europe, for example. So when you get the time, I would strongly uh, urge you to just go to video.google.com, okay, and just type in Google Data Center, and you'll see a few videos. You'll see a few videos of some of their uh, of what goes on in their data center. Now these videos are not generated from the perspective of understanding how indexing is done by those nodes. Okay, this is done. These videos are prepared more uh, to show you um, what their facility looks like. Okay, what sort of uh, energy efficiency, if energy efficient solutions they are using? Because you know, when you have these tens of thousands of machines placed packed inside a single warehouse you know the temperature inside the warehouse could blow up if 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 you weren't uh, actually cooling down the systems using uh, you know some advanced techniques so power management cooling and all those issues are pretty important for uh, managing data centers and so you'll see some of those issues addressed in uh, in these videos okay so just out of curiosity uh, I, I would strongly recommend you to just watch uh, these videos, they're not very long, they're just a few minutes long. So, imagine a cluster which has a thousand nodes. Now suppose each node has a probability of 0.999 of not failing. Okay, let's say that each node on an average is up for 99.9% .9 of the time. Now, if if your system was non-fault tolerant, what that means is if 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 you required every single node to be up for the system as a whole to be functioning, then you can see that the uptime of the system would be very small. The answer given here is thirty is sixty three percent, but when I did the calculation, it came came to about thirty six percent. So you may want to verify this. Basically, if each individual node has a probability of 0.999 of being up what is the what is the probability that the entire system will be up the entire system will be up if every single machine in that system is up right because we are assuming a non fault tolerant system here in that case the probability that the entire system will be up will be 0.999 times uh, raised to the power of 1000 because every single machine has to be up for the system as a whole to be up and what is the probability that machine 1 will be up? 0.999. What is the probability that machine 2 will be up? 0.999. What is the probability that machine 1 and machine 2 will be up? 0.999 times 0.999. And what is the probability that all 1000 machines will be up? Well, 0.999 multiplied by itself a 1000 times. And that comes to about 36%. Now, clearly this is not good, right? So assuming that your systems are not going to be fault tolerant is not good. We will need to assume that they can fail. Okay. 